I'm Dr. Robert Redfield. I'm the surgical director of the Living Donor Kidney Program here at Penn. And thanks to everyone out there uh, for joining us today for our inaugural uh, virtual Living Donor Symposium. It's been, you know, obviously quite a year and um, uh, one of the, I guess, benefits is that we are able to kind of meet virtually. Um, this month is an exciting month for us in organ transplantation. It's uh, the month of April is uh, the National Donor Awareness Month. And um, today we're here to, to celebrate our living donors. You know, every week um, as a transplant surgeon, I have the privilege of meeting some of the, the most extraordinary um, individuals as they pursue organ donation. And today we're here together to celebrate these living donors. They truly are heroes. Uh, hear firsthand stories, learn more about the organ donation process, and hopefully spread some awareness. You know, just some housekeeping uh, issues for this afternoon. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat box at any time. Uh, there are multiple members, our medical director, as well as um, some of our NPs and PAs to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, most of our donors uh, are, that are featured here today are also able to answer questions, and you can direct any specific questions to them uh, as needed. At the end, we'll have a live Q&A to hopefully address some additional questions. Um, and before we begin our journey through the donor experience, we wanted to take the time for everyone to see what it's meant for our prior living donors to provide the gift of life. So let's roll the montage. I donated a portion of my liver to my then four-year-old nephew. I donated the right lobe of my liver to my father. I donated a kidney to my wife's ex-husband, Kevin. In 2007, my mom passed away very suddenly. For the past 13 years, I've been a representative with Gift of Life on behalf of donor family members. When I was asked by a mutual friend just for information regarding organ donation, there was something in that exchange that I said, you know what, I want to throw my name in the hat. And six months later, and many tests later, we were a perfect match. And I went from having a stranger in my life to now a brother. I ended up not having children, so I wasn't able to share my health through a baby, through having a baby. So I decided that organ donation was a way that I could still bring forth life, just in a different way. I started volunteering at a camp for kids with cancer in 2006. One of the counselors posted on Facebook that she needed a kidney donor and I said, I'll get tested. And I happened to be a perfect match for her. So I chose to donate because Amory made it look cool. <laughs> it always sounds strange when you say this, but my wife's ex-husband's family, because we shared, you know, it's his stepchildren I see as my, ch or his children I see as my children. Again, he is family, you know what I mean? And, and, and that's my stepchildren's father. I mean, how often in our lives, I mean, unless you're, unless you're a doctor, maybe you're a surgeon or whatever, how often in our lives are we put in a position that we can honestly affect someone to that point? You know, you can honestly save their life or at least, or at least let them have a normal life. Larry and I met about 10 years ago. Um, I was working as an elevator man and the building I was working on, um, was a homeless shelter. Larry is a counselor at the homeless shelter. I was asking, you know, a little nervous because uh, I was nervous around homeless people. I had been sheltered my whole life and I didn't know. And I was talking with Larry about it. He educated me on be nice to everybody. He struck me as a very charismatic and wonderful person that taught me a life lesson that day and we remained friends you know, like I said, 10 years. And, you know, we don't talk often, but we talk enough. A very special person. So I stopped over to his house, and then, you know, he was feeling a little down, and I was trying to stir him up a little bit. And I was going on, and said, well, I'm not doing as good as I thought. What do you mean? Well, my dialysis is really not going well, and 
doesn't make it better anymore. And without a donor, it wasn't going to be much longer. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it behooves me as a person not to at least find out if I could help. I pursued organ donation because I'm selfish. Um, my 17 year old daughter was on the verge of end stage chronic kidney disease due to a extremely rare manifestation of Crohn's disease in her kidney. And that's when I learned about the National Kidney Registry voucher program. It was an immediate decision and I was never more sure of anything ever. Uh, I was able to donate my spare kidney to someone whose life depended on it today. And in return, a voucher was issued with my daughter's name on it that guarantees her a living donor organ should she ever need one. My father will always say that uh, he was uncomfortable at first, but when my father was 21 years old, he lost his mother to breast cancer. And a doctor asked him if there was anything he could have done as a 21 year old for her to live, would you have done it? And he said, yes. And the doctor said, how do you think your kids will feel and your son will feel if you don't let them donate? Prior to my donation, I had run half marathons. I'm a very active person. And my biggest concern was, will my quality of life change dramatically after the process? And looking at me, you'd really never know that I was an organ donor. I'm four months out from, from donation and I would never even, I would never even otherwise know. I sometimes even forget um, that I have donated a kidney. I feel great. It hasn't hurt me physically at all. I mean, it was a couple weeks, a little sore, but I didn't miss any work. One week vacation I took, I didn't miss any work. I didn't miss any time. It's been about a year and a half, and I just, you know, did an hour class this morning. I ran three miles afterwards. My life has completely not changed at all. I have a really cool scar, and I have a really cool story but my life itself has not changed in any way, shape or form. My discomfort was really temporary. It really only lasted a couple of weeks. And here you have a guy that, that hopefully lives the next 20, 30, however many years of his life. The entire process going through Penn was flawless. You get treated with such respect and such dignity and they really do have your well-being at hand the entire time. Everyone at University of Pennsylvania was great deal. They answered all my questions. I would return to a pen transplant at any moment. The transplant coordinator, to the nurses, to my surgeon, who I love dearly. The whole process um, made me feel like part of the family and made me feel like I was the only patient they were dealing with. Dr. Najee came into the operating room when I was still awake and he came over and he held my hand while I was being put to sleep. And even though it was just a few seconds of his time, it meant the world to me and I'll never forget it. I would say that kidney donation has been the most joyful thing I've ever um, done. I mean, apart from probably giving birth to my children, um, which by the way, was way more painful than kidney donation. Um. <laughs> my advice is, Challenge what you think you know about being um, a living organ donor. Emotionally, I feel like I got a lot out of it myself. I, I can look back on the memory and feel really good about what I did and, and how I helped somebody. Spiritually and emotionally, it really raised my awareness how the impact that one person can have on not just that individual. You impacted that person, their family, but then all these other people that they've had positive impacts with throughout their life. It's weird how small and connected the world is. And I think like giving a kidney kind of brings you um, a sense of connectedness to the rest of the world. But I started a kidney chain of four people. So four people got a kidney because I shared my spare. And I feel like, um, you know, give one, get four is like a pretty good deal. Um, and so I, I definitely have like a very strong sense of pride um, about the donation as well as advocacy. Organ donation has saved my life. It gave us peace, it gave us clarity, it gave us hope in a time when there was absolutely none. I was shocked when I woke up from surgery how joyful I was, like literally giddy about the whole thing it was it was just amazing it makes me realize just how valuable life is 
it really does make you feel, you know, just good about yourself and good about the world and good about the universe. It is single-handedly the most important thing I've ever done in my whole life and will forever be the most important thing um, in my life. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Oh, 100%. And it was by far the most wonderful thing I have ever done. But I could help save a life without it being a problem. I, I thought that was fantastic. It's something um, not to be afraid of, right? It's something to run towards, not run away from. People will say, oh, well, you're a hero. You did this wonderful thing. I don't look at it as being a hero. I think most living donors who donated to a family member or a loved one, nobody really looks at it as being a hero. You look at it as I'm helping someone that I love that I don't want to die when there's something I can do to help. You don't need to feel like a hero or be a hero. You can be a normal everyday person and you can literally save a life. Knowing that you have the power to literally change another person's life and save their life, it's very awe-inspiring, it's very humbling. I am a living, walking testament to the fact that organ donation saves lives and that I get to be a blessing to others. You know, every time I've, I've seen that a number of times and every time I see it, it still um, gives me goosebumps. You know, these uh, the donors um, that that go forward and do this really are, you know, heroes. And I think, you know, one of the the things for all of us to think about is that, um, you know, there's 100,000 people waiting on the organ transplant wait list. And if um, we were all able to. Um, find people like this. Um, and I have to think in a country of 300 million people plus, there's 100,000 people like this that would be willing to donate. We could we could eradicate the uh, the organ transplant wait list. Um, so to kick off our, our next um, uh, video, uh, really to kick off our personal donor experiences is um, Cherie. Um, and not only does she have a powerful story to tell, uh, like all of our donors, but I think um, some of the messages that she um, um, portrays will uh, allow us to think about how you can go about finding a potential living donor and really um, raise awareness about uh, organ donation. Um, so let's hear from Cherie. My name is Cherie DeBrest, and I donated a portion of my liver to a coworker in December of 2019. I learned that my recipient was in need of a liver transplant through a company newsletter. The message from our CEO was about organ donation. And it opened with the recognition and the importance of organ donation. Then the email concluded with one of our employees who was actively searching. One of us was in need. She went from being a very active mother of two boys working in the emergency room to um, having to take a leave of work and be listed for liver transplant. Um, as you can see, I am an African-American woman. I am also a social worker by profession at a pediatric hospital. Fortunately and unfortunately, I've been a part of very sensitive conversations where I have as a social worker supported a family as the team discussed with them that their child, who was our patient, was in need of a transplant or at the end of their life and could potentially be an organ donor. As an African-American woman who's an emergency room doctor, she needed to live her presence as a woman of color in that emergency room in Southwest Philadelphia is meaningful to the patients that come through there. It just so happened that in her network of friends and family, no one was able to match. But because she was able to step out on faith and make her situation public, that message was able to reach me. You never know who might be willing to answer that call. 
there are a variety of ways to share their story. And my suggestion is that you take the opportunity to share it at your place of employment if you feel safe enough to do so. I happen to work at a hospital, so everyone's place of business may be different. Um, but that was a, definitely a message that the hospital was willing to share and the head of our organization was willing to share that message herself. Sharing through social media, you never know, a friend of a friend may see your story and may feel inclined to say, I think I can help that person. Reach out to your religious community. It would be wonderful if religious communities could have a special recognition when there's not a person in particular in need, but just to share information so that it becomes a part of people's conversation. And then if the time should come where a person was in need, you have that awareness already planted, that seed has been planted. After several people within my organization became aware that I was coming forward to help a coworker, my human resources team actually changed what was the policy. Before I made the decision, if you were to go out for a procedure, you would have to use a week of your vacation time and then tap into your restricted medical leave, sick time, which I was prepared to do. Because I was willing to make this sacrifice they changed the policy. And from this point forward, anyone that steps forward as a living donor does not have to tap into their vacation time. They can go straight to their restricted bank for medical sick time. So I was able to save my vacation time. I feel extremely blessed that I was able to donate a portion of my liver to save a life. I cannot thank the Penn team enough. I was extremely impressed by the detail and the care that they took to provide me with all of the facts, including the risks. They did not hold back. And at every stage of the process, I was able to talk openly about how I was feeling, about any concerns I was having, any anxiety, all the way to where they were wheeling me on the gurney to the operating room. I was told, you are the, you actually are the most important person at this moment. And if you decide that you have changed your mind, we will stop right now and cancel this operation no questions asked. So I felt very good going into the procedure. I felt very strong. I felt very um, well informed. As an African American woman, this was such a powerful experience and an opportunity. I know the comorbidities that we live with, all of these chronic conditions that we as a people suffer with, moves us into a higher risk category for being the one in need. At some point, someone that we love will have to ask someone else to make that sacrifice. I, I felt that it was important for me to take that opportunity to be the person to say yes and save her life and hopefully one day when she walks back into that emergency room and she sees her first patient and they look up at her face, they will have their, their physician back. They will have their, their lifeline back. And I was able to have a hand in that. Thank you, Sheree, for um, that just beautiful story. And I, I think, you know, Sheree highlighted many important things um, very nicely. You know, I think most importantly is 
um, a lot of the barriers that do exist. I will say, you know, we've worked really hard over the last couple of years nationally to try to start breaking down some of those barriers, kind of the, the financial barriers. Um, programs have expanded for lost wage reimbursement and travel and lodging reimbursement. Um, I do think we do have a ways to go on decreasing the barriers to, you know, the socioeconomic barriers to living donation. Because the reality is, um, is living donation really is the best therapy we can offer patients with end-stage organ disease. And we need to make sure everyone has access um, to that. She highlighted uh, the employee benefits. I, I will make a plug for the American Society of Transplantation just recently instituted um, a living donor circle of excellence for employers um, to sign on to. Uh, and Penn Medicine, I'm proud to say, was one of the first organizations to sign on for that. And that is um, um, a commitment to be able to support employees to be able to donate and pursue donation such that they, they don't have to dip into their vacation time, um, that they will have paid time off, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, it may be helpful if we're able to expand other employers to join uh, and uh, your own employers out there, uh, please have them join the AST Living Donor Circle of Excellence. Many people also ask, you know, do you need to, does your donor need to be the same sex, race, age? Know, to donate the recipient and, and the answer is 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 no really the the only thing um, that recipients need to identify is a a a person who's willing to consider donation um, and then we take it from there and we decide with them if this is something that they can do um, so up next uh, our next um, uh, personal story is from dr. Frankel Dr. Frankel is a very unique um, is a very unique story, and I think probably there's no one uh, who understands the risks of organ donation and benefits um, more than Dr. Frankel, because not only is he a kidney donor, uh, but he's also a nephrologist. He's a, a doctor who his specialty is the kidney. Um, so let's hear Dr. Frankel's story. My name is Dr. Christopher Frankel. I'm a nephrologist, and I donated a kidney to uh, another nephrologist. The recipient I donated to, I used to work with. Uh, he had hired me long ago. About a few years after I joined the practice, he had this kind of funny flank pain. And as a nephrologist, he knew that, uh, you know, flank pain could be a kidney stone. So he ultrasounded himself and saw cysts on his kidneys. He knew right away that that wasn't good. At that point, his kidney function was normal, but of course, as the years went by, his kidney function deteriorated. We thought of the day came when um, he said that, you know, that he might have to stop practicing because his kidneys were failing. I felt it, it was such an ironic set of circumstances to happen to him. And so as a nephrologist, I know it's, I know what's in store for him in the future if he does not get a transplant. And considering his disease was genetic, he might not have family members who could donate to him, but I certainly um, uh, respected him and felt um, extremely compassionate uh, for his uh, unfortunate set of circumstances. So long ago, I told him, I, I said, Greg, I'll give you my kidney when that time comes. This year, Dr. Zollner became one of the nearly 100,000 Americans who needed a kidney transplant. Chris had always said to me, I'll give you a kidney when you need one. Uh, and I had never really taken him that seriously. Stepping up like that, knowing his character, um, it doesn't surprise me. Six weeks after surgery, Dr. Zollner says he feels like himself again for the first time in years. And Dr. Frankel is back to work. How proud I am to uh, have uh, been able to, to give you a kidney and get your life back. I cannot express my thanks in words that make any sense. I knew I would do fine. I, I happen to know the risks of losing one kidney. I predicted uh, that I would do very well from a surgical standpoint and very well from a post-surgical standpoint in terms of maintaining uh, a healthy single kidney. I had taken care of plenty of patients who had had you know, similar surgery and knew what was in store for me. 
it, it hasn't really changed how I practice uh, taking care of kidney patients, although I think there's a respect that the patients now have for me, have some of them having learned of what I did, I sense a, a, a greater willingness of some of the patients to actually accept my advice and go get, uh, get on the transplant list. It's safe <laughs> and it, uh, if you're a healthy person who can donate a kidney, it's a very safe surgery uh, and it saves a life. It really does. I mean, I think the public, the lay public kind of does not really appreciate the rigors and the mortality, uh, the high risk of death associated with being a dialysis patient. Uh, and, and obviously if you're, if you're a, a kidney patient who gets a living a, a donor, you are going to likely have longevity equal to if you didn't have the transplant at all in the first place or any kidney problems in the first place. So you know, I would hope that the, you know, I would give the public or the people I'm talking to a better appreciation of, of that, uh, that this is a far better uh, therapy for kidney failure than, than, than is dialysis. Because most people just do not know how bad dialysis can be. There, there's always some trepidations uh, for patients, uh, I'm sorry, for people who, who want to donate. And um, whether that is what's going to happen to me with having one kidney, or what if a family member down the road needs the kidney that all that I just donated, and these things you just can't control for. Um, but I would I would tell them if they if they even consider that, then they're they're ninety percent closer to actually doing it. Um, so and I would I would follow you know their heart and and follow through on it. The the pride is unbelievable to transform someone's life and get it back to where it used to be is, it's an unbelievable feeling. It really doesn't hit you until weeks to, to months later, not only with self-reflection, but when others sort of approach you as they've learned what you've done, it's an unbelievable uh, feeling. As a physician, you know, having given treatment to save people's lives, it's a little bit more than that. Uh, quite honestly. And then I got cards from patients who found out what I did. I had physicians who are friendly with me crying in front of me. Um, so it was, it's quite moving. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't say it's, it, I'm extremely proud of what I did. Thanks, Dr. Frankel. And um, I mean, what an amazing uh, story. I was fortunate enough to, to take, um, take part in uh, Dr. Frankel's care. Um, and I think he highlights, um, you know, some really important considerations. And, you know, first and foremost, um, if, if you want to, if you're considering living donation, um, you're going to go through a battery of tests, which we'll describe shortly. And uh, if you make it through and are considered um, a, an appropriate donor, the risks are very, very, very low um, um, in today's day and age. And uh, really the long-term risks are, are, are less than 1%. Um, so, you know, if you flip it the other way around, there's a 99 plus percent chance that everything will be fine. And the reward, the payoff is, not only to save a life, um, we do a lot of things in medicine that saves people's lives, but it's making their quality of life, you know, basically returning it back to normal so that they can live a normal life and run marathons and climb mountains, do whatever they need to do um, or what they were doing before. Um, and I think the additional um, thing too is really how much better living donation is for recipients, not just over dialysis, but also over deceased donation. I, my wish for all my patients is that they could have access, uh, they all could have access to a live donor kidney. Uh, these kidneys typically work right away um, and they tend to last about twice as long um, as deceased donor organs. Um, so next we have uh, uh, Dr. Bitterman, who is uh, the medical director um, of the Live Donor Liver Program, as well as Dr. Leonberg, who's the medical director of the Live Donor Kidney Program. 
who will go into a more detailed overview of who is eligible to donate, as well as the evaluation process. Take it away. Hi there, my name is Tess Bitterman, and I am the Medical Director of the Living Liver Donor Program at Penn. I'm so glad you are here today for our first Living Donor Symposium. I'm going to take a few minutes to go over what we are looking for when considering a potential living kidney or liver donor at our center. The number one factor that we take into consideration is the health of the donor. This relates not only to their current health and ensuring the safety of donor surgery, but also thinking about issues that may impact their long-term health, as well as things that undergoing donor surgery now could change in the future. We also want to make sure that the recipient has the best opportunity to do well with the donated organ, both soon after transplant and also in the long term. Perhaps not surprisingly, kidney donors need to have normal kidney function and liver donors need to have normal liver function. We also require that our donors be free of certain chronic conditions. Examples that would be important rule outs both for potential kidney and liver donors are uncontrolled high blood pressure and diabetes. Donors should also be free of active cancer. We will consider donors, however, who may have had a past history of certain cancers on a case-by-case -case basis. Donors should be of healthy weight. Typically, this means a body mass index less than 35, and we can help guide donors on losing weight with the help of our nutritionist if that's needed. They also need to be in a good state of mental well-being and follow a generally healthy lifestyle, for instance, with regards to alcohol and tobacco. Our usual donor age ranges are 21 to 70 years old for kidney donors and 21 to 50 for liver donors. We will, however, consider older and younger donors on a case-by-case -case basis, since after all, age is more than just a number. It is important for donors to have their own health insurance. While the donor workup and surgery is usually paid for by the recipient's health insurance, sometimes we may discover health issues during the process that will need follow-up in the future. It is encouraged that donors have a primary care doctor, and they should also have a good support system who can help them through the recovery process. And lastly, donors need to have the ability to complete the required testing. This usually in large part will take place here at Penn, but special accommodations can sometimes be made for potential donors who live outside of our general region. My name is Amanda Leonberg Yu, and I am a kidney specialist and the medical director of the Living Kidney Donor Program at Penn. Now that you've learned about who is eligible to become a living donor, I will be giving you a bird's eye view of the process of considering living donation. There are four phases of living donation, and there are responsibilities on your part as a candidate for living organ donation, and on our part as your living donor care team. The first phase of the process is the referral phase. The referral phase is designed for you to learn more about living donation and for us to learn more about your health history. You will apply through an online referral portal where you will need to provide medical information about yourself and about your family. You will have blood work done, similar to what your primary care doctor would ask of you for an annual exam. After this is completed, our living donor care team will review your health history and your blood work. This is also the time where you will learn much more about what it means to be a living kidney or a liver donor through online educational modules. You will also speak on the phone with our living donor advocate, who is truly your advocate in this process, focusing solely on your needs as a potential donor in the process of living donation. Provided there are no barriers to proceeding after this initial phase, you can move on to our next phase, the evaluation. During the evaluation phase, the bulk of the work is on your living donor care team. It is during this phase that you will meet several members of our care team, have additional blood work, other diagnostic tests, including compatibility testing and imaging studies. Your job in this phase is to be sure that you have seen your own primary care doctor to make sure that you're up to date on your health care and cancer screening. This stage ends with a decision from our committee, after which time you can move to the next phase of care, donation. 
The donation process also starts with a living donor care team, where you will meet surgeons and others involved in your hospital stay. Your biggest role in this phase is following instructions that your care team provides prior to and after donation. Finally, after the donation phase, we care that you continue to enjoy good health. After surgery, you can expect to have clinic visits with surgeons, your specialists, and your primary care doctor. We expect you to return to your good state of health after donation, and part of maintaining this good health is seeing your primary doctor. To conclude, I'd like to remind you that we are your team in this donor evaluation process. We work for you to be sure that you understand the risks related to living donation and to answer any questions you may have about your results or your risks. We also work with you to be sure that this is a safe endeavor for you, and we partner with you to ensure continued good health is achieved after your gift of life. We feel privileged to be part of your care, and we look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A session. So thanks to my colleagues for that uh, that key information about donor eligibility. Um, you know, just highlighting um, uh, that last comment uh, about us partnering with our with our donors. I, that's that's completely right. And and I will say, you know, we are we are focused on elevating um, the care experience for our living donors. You know, we are just every referral that comes in. Uh, we're blown away that people are 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 willing to explore this, and our commitment is not only to to making sure it's a streamlined um, and and positive experience, um, but to make sure it's it's safe and um, it is the right one, you know, for you. Um, so those who may have a potential donor, um, living donor. Um, who lives uh, out of state, we, we do have some donors who travel to us from, from far away. And our next donor uh, will help provide a better understanding of that evaluation for out of state donors. My name is Mary Ellen Goodwin. I donated a kidney. My donation was a non-directed exchange. It went to a woman who lives in Minnesota. My name's John Goodwin and I'm a kidney recipient in May of 2016. And my donor was my daughter, my oldest daughter. She's a nurse and she donated my kidney. Transplants changed my life dramatically, actually, because um, I was the one that was living with kidney disease. I actually had it for 28 years. You're kind of in a fog. I'd be up two hours a night with leg cramps. I had bouts of gout. Then on top of that, they throw a diet onto you that is <laughs> like, it's like eating wood every day. Basically, there's no taste. There's, you can't eat anything special. It was a, it was a challenge and uh, I, luckily I, I got through it. I, feel, I actually feel great. In fact, I played golf today. Not well, but I played <laughs> it. I'm not on the restricted diet. I have energy. I lift weights. I walk. I, I feel 100% better and I, it actually makes me wince when I hear people that um, have kidney disease because I know exactly what they're going for. My motivation was I've, I've experienced it firsthand what someone who has kidney uh, disease, how it, what it, how hard it is for them to live. Um, at the time that I was ready to donate, my daughter had donated to my husband in 2016. I donated at that, I volunteered at that time. Um, they decided not to use mine. So I didn't know anyone at the time that I was donating. So I decided to go with the, um, <laughs> the non-directed exchange kidney. The National Kidney Registry has a list of, of folks that are in need of a kidney. When I donated, I did not know who it was going to. I, it, they select the person who is the best match for my kidney, and then it is given to that person. The difficult part is you, sometimes you don't know, but it's fabulous to know that you did help somebody to transform their life for the better. I did find out the person, I did send a letter, and I, a year later, I did discover who the person was. As far as I know, she is still doing well, um, and she's very happy to have received my kidney. 
her health has improved tremendously. In order to donate, there are quite, quite a long list of tests and evaluations that have to be completed. In the beginning, I thought it was going to be somewhat of a challenge to do that, but it turned out it was turned out to be a very simple process. The transplant team was wonderful. They communicated through email, um, texts, and the good old standard US mail. Um, we used most of the resources down in South Carolina in order to do the pre-donation -donat uh, blood. Um, that was all sent through the mail. Um, and, you know, I got, re I got my local medical records from my doctors locally here. Everything turned out very well. My follow-up was completed in person immediately following surgery. After that, it was done either by telephone, email, or the, through my, my, my Penn Medicine portal. I did not have a telemed per se at that time. This was prior to COVID, so that that resource wasn't available at that time. But since I live in South Carolina, a lot of it was done long distance so that uh, we talked on the telephone. I did uh, questionnaires over the My Portal and uh, it went very smooth. The team was fantastic. I would like to tell them to keep up their hope and their spirits. Um, they, they have to ask. You, nobody's gonna come up to you and walk around and just say, oh, I want to give you at least, at least most of the time. Um, you're going to have to ask around. You're going to have to make it um, known that you need a kidney, number one, or your friends or relatives need a kidney. Number two, you have to educate yourself because when you find out that people with one kidney live as long as people with two kidneys and, and that the kidney Basically, the one kidney takes over the function of two. You, you know, when you go all to these seminars and meetings and, and drills that they transplant puts you through before you can ever donate a kidney or, re, or receive one, um, you find out all the, all the um, stuff that would be, you would think would be fearsome and um, isn't really at all. I mean, that, you know, it's laparoscopic 99% of the time and it's, it's you know, it's uh, and then they wake up and they're they're truly a hero. So I would just want people to know that they have to ask. They got to make and educate people and tell people this is how it works and this is this is the system and this is how you this is what you do. And if you don't donate, you you don't have to donate to Fred. You can donate to Ethel, and then Ethel will you know get okay. one and get on and it'll be a chain and they'll come around to Fred eventually. You know so. Fred will get one, but he might, might be six ways. hours later. <laughs> and then the bottom line is too, to take any worry out of the system is they, they make it so as if you're a donator, okay, and you're in need, you're, you go right to the top of the list, which was, you know, obviously big with me, with my daughter. I, you know, I didn't want my daughter to donate a kidney and then 20 years from now, need a kidney. Need a kidney. And they said, no, no, that doesn't happen because she, the National Kidney Register, she will be to the top of the list being a donor. So it's, and people don't know that, you know, and how would they, you know, unless they educate themselves or people in need educate them. I've been going to pain medicine for 28 years. It's a daily struggle with kidney disease, but, you know, I trusted my doctors and trusted everything they said. And finally, you know, and I needed a kidney and they took care of that too. So the one of, that was one of the reasons we did this long distance um, rather than we could have done it down here in South Carolina and gone to MUSC is because, and the doctors in Penn explained that to us. They were very good. They said, you know, you don't have to come all the way up here to donate a kidney for Marion. Yeah. Marion gives donate. We said, well, we're comfortable with Penn. We, very we, comfortable with we, the we team. Were, we were comfortable with the team. We knew the, we knew the system. We knew the floor. We knew when we literally went back there, we knew the nurses. It's, it's very helpful. To, to have trust in the team and to know that they are behind you 100%. And you, we never ever doubted the fact that they were always looking out for our best interest. They're a fabulous team, yep. truly. How has organ donation changed my life? You're a couple pounds lighter. <laughs> a couple <laughs> pounds lighter, yeah. Um, 
it makes me realize just how valuable life is. It, it was a great experience. I think the transplant team does a great job. At this point, um, and my daughter will tell you the same thing, we don't even realize that we gave a kidney. You, it's, we feel perfectly normal. Um, you just have that satisfaction of knowing that you can assist somebody and give them back the life that they should be living. I'm actually um, proud of both of them. I mean, how can you not be? They're both wonderful people. I had two donors right away. My daughter and my, my wife stepped right up and um, either one of them would have done it. And they basically, they ruled my wife out right away because they said, well, you need one person to take care of you when you get your kidney. So we're going to pick your daughter. <laughs> and that's how it kind of shook out, but humbled because I was a recipient of one and proud of both of them because they both saved lives. It, my daughter saved my life and my wife saved somebody's life that she doesn't even know. I'm proud and humbled. That's all I can say. <laughs>I mean, there's a few restrictions. I, I was I was so active before, like working around, I do, I do around the house, New York, and everything like that, and with the grandkids, I'm still doing it. 
basketball is over. I finished that. Across the started Saturday. I'm doing that. And I feel good. And that's a blessing. I, I feel really good. And the blessing is sitting right beside me. <laughs> so my recovery post um, uh, discharge from the hospital was, it was interesting. Um, at the time, my dad was still in the hospital. Um, so I came home. I was home for a couple of days. And then um, at that time, I was still sore. Um, my stomach was still bothering me a little bit. Um, but all the drains were out. Everything was looking good. My incision was healing well. I was off all pain medication. Um, but my dad was still in the hospital. So I was actually going in and out every day post. So I was a little unique situation. It took me about to feel normal. I would say about six weeks. Um, even then I would still get little twinges because it's your abdominal muscles. You don't realize how much you use them until you um, have them cut. <laughs> Um, but it was, it wasn't bad. And I would say by eight weeks, I was really, I was, I was walking miles around my neighborhood. Um, I was doing things that, um, I wasn't thinking I would have been able to do. And I was working a little bit in my yard. I wasn't lifting or anything, but like, I was able to do stuff that I could continue my daily life and do things that I wanted to do. Um, and I was very well prepared. I think my liver coordinator, um, Linda Wood, was absolutely amazing. So for me, I definitely was well prepared and she gave me so many things. And I also talked to somebody beforehand, which was nice. It's actually quite simple. You have your surgical follow-ups obviously at four weeks, um, eight weeks and at 12 weeks. Um, at those appointments, you're getting blood work. You are seen with the your a meeting with your transplant team, um, checking in, um, how are you feeling, any complications, anything weird going on, um, which is really nice because it's nice to see how your liver is actually growing because for me, I'm a nurse, so I actually was able to see my lab results and say, wow, this is great. Um, I can see how my liver is regrowing just through my lab results and understanding them. Um, and then at 12 weeks, I had my scan to see the size of my um, liver. And at that point, I was amazed. I was able to see that my liver was completely regrown and I was absolutely floored by it. Um, and then after that, I have a, I had a um, three month follow up in January, January, no, six month follow up in January, which went great. Again, blood work, just talking with um, my hepatologist, going over some things and I'm going to do my yearly checkup with my primary and then I'll see my um, hepatologist again at one year. Same thing, labs, just discussing life, how I'm feeling. And, um, and then I get checked up by uh, Linda, my coordinator also for the, uh, for UNOS, just giving my weight, my blood pressure, what my labs are doing and stuff like that. I work with the transplant team because I'm a child yeah. picky nurse. It's hilarious. So I knew all of them before we even went into this. And I actually just had a patient the other night who got the call uh, at midnight for his liver. So, and I was his nurse and it was, very emotional for me. And then to see the team come in and see him in the morning, it was like, it, it was, it was amazing. Living donation, if you have somebody who's willing to do it, I know it's hard to ask somebody to do it, but it's a game changer. It made me understand my life, my dad's life. Just look at family differently, look at the world differently. It's, it's worth asking. You never know who might be your savior. I mean, there's a, there's a million words out there and the words don't express my, I don't want to say gratitude. I, want, I don't want to say I'm, it's thankful. It's just, it's just unbelievable. Her unselfishness is just beyond words. And it's just nothing I can, no, it's just, I get emotional with this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's, it, it's a family thing for us. It really is. You know, uh, thank you. Thank you is not is not a big, a big enough word. It's definitely worth the wait. <laughs> and what we went through the pandemic and everything, having to uh, actually canceled twice one day, one time, the second time, one day before surgery, 
It's just be patient. It's worth the wait. And the end results, it, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a living example. Giving me the opportunity to be a husband, a father, pop up. It, it's definitely worth the wait. Thanks, Brooke and Bud. And um, I think uh, Brooks may, makes a, a really good point about the donor process. Care doesn't stop after surgery. Um, you continue to have close follow-up with uh, the Penn Care team after donation. Uh, while the expectation is the recovery is quite quick, uh, long-term follow-up with the Penn team and, and your primary care provider uh, is obviously important to, to uh, your continued good health. Next up, we have uh, Jason Hornberger, uh, who was kind enough to share his story um, and is uh, rather soon after his operation, actually. Um, but he wanted to share his story, and I think it's it's a unique one uh, because Jason is our first donor at Penn uh, who has given the gift of life not once, but twice. It's the day before surgery. It's the, it's the day before surgery. surgery. It's, the it's the morning of surgery. surgery. The morning day, after uh, surgery. days post-surgery. My name's Jason, and I'm a living liver donor. Uh, I donated my liver in December of 2016 at University of Penn, and it was really a great experience. I did it for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, it was a, a longtime family friend. If he went out to the community and asked for a living donor to help him, there was actually a, a really large turnout of people who had wanted to help. My, my father actually applied, my wife applied. I went through the whole process that Penn had. They, they tested everything of uh, physically that I was a match, physically that I was able to handle it, uh, mentally, emotionally, is it something that I'm capable of doing? And uh, I eventually got tagged as the target donor and became the, uh, the living donor in December of that year. I had a, a support network around me of my, my parents actually lived in an in-laws quarters at my house. So I had uh, extra hands to help with uh, my daughter who had just turned one years old when we had surgery. My wife's uh, mother had actually passed away when she was young and uh, was a donor when she passed. So that was a great opportunity to honor my mother-in-law who I never had an opportunity to meet. When somebody asked if for help. I want to be the type of person that says, yes, I'll try. And that's, that's all I did. What's interesting now is my recipient who uh, again, received a liver. Um, it's not uncommon for liver recipients to have issues with their kidneys going forward because of the anti-rejection meds. Um, so in a couple days, I'm actually going to be his kidney donor. So this is the, the second time I'm going through the process again at Penn. They've been fantastic. And, um, I'm, putting my body in the hands of some of the smartest people in the world. It's the day before surgery and I'm getting my all my preparation done. I feel good about it. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to uh, to do something great. So the, the only other thing I'm doing, I guess I had my last meal of the day. I, I had my I started fasting um, now and I'll, I'll start my bowel prep in a little bit. Uh, I was just drinking about half of this bottle um, and trying to stay hydrated through the day and um, be ready for surgery tomorrow morning. It's the morning of surgery, and uh, it's about probably a little after 5 a.m. Um, packed up here at my house. We're getting ready to drive down to University of Penn. Surgery should start at 8.45, uh, and um, I should be done by 1, 2 o'clock. Uh, I know my surgery goes in first, and then uh, my recipient will go in uh, soon after I think they have me open. Um, so uh, wish me luck. So surgery went well. I've been moved to Rhodes 4 for in the, I guess this is the recovery wing. Um, and my job is to start uh, drinking and walking. So it's about 5.30 now, but um, no, as soon as I got up here, I uh, just started, went out, did a couple laps walking around the halls, and uh, everything's going really well. So I've, I've started drinking some cranberry juice, apple juice, water, 
really just focus on resting and doing some more walking today and I'll see my doctors again tomorrow. But overall, I'm, I'm doing great. Um, and I really just uh, laid down and the doctors uh, did their thing. <laughs> I went to sleep, they did their work. And um, you know, it just feels like I did a lot of crunches in my belly and they're, they're taking care of my pain management. Um, everything's going really well. So it's Friday at around uh, almost 3.30 and uh, they, I got my discharge papers. So they're gonna let me go home and relax and recover from home. Um, they gave me my prescriptions to take home with me uh, with more pain management. And um, overall I'm sore, but um, I'll be able to walk while I'm still at home, deal with my pain management, just continue to rest. I went in Thursday morning for surgery and I'm gonna come out uh, you know, here on Friday. Probably by five o'clock I'll be on the road back home. So uh, no, great experience, my recipient's doing great. So uh, all went really well. So I just got home tonight and got to see my babies, George uh, uh, uh. and Nina. Are you happy to have daddy home? Yeah, yeah. And my wife, I'm so happy to be back with. And uh, there's nothing that makes you feel better than being at home. So Penn did a great job giving me uh, pain management uh, handle while I'm here. Still have a little bit of pain, but overall just uh, happy to be back and overall feel, still feel you know, relatively pretty good and um, gonna hopefully feel better every day. So, but mostly happy to be, uh, be with my wife and kids. Thank you, Penn. It's been 10 full days post-surgery and I actually have gotten clearance to go back to work today. So I'm uh, gonna be working full time. I'm here in my home office, so it's not too hard for me. I um, actually put on jeans for the first time today, which is a nice milestone. I'm feeling really good. The, that first day I got home, the car ride was a little bit rough, a lot of, a lot of bouncing around. Um, didn't sleep great that night, and uh, still haven't slept a perfect night yet. But it's, uh, it's progress every day, and my uh, biggest advice is just uh, kind of recognize that and know that it's gonna be, um, a little bit better every day. It's part of the process to not feel perfect. Not everybody is back home the, the day after surgery and back to work this quickly. But um, all I did was just make sure I stayed committed to going walking and to make sure I rest throughout the day as I need it and uh, get out for walks. And then it's still gonna be, uh, tomorrow's gonna be better than today. And I'm gonna have a, a really good recovery and uh, all thanks to the folks at Penn. Great to see that uh, Jason had We're also grateful to be part of the next myself and Dr. Altoff, who is director of the live dinner liver program as well as the the division chief of transplantation here. Uh, we're going to take uh, just a few minutes to go over just a high-level surgical uh, review of the surgical process in more detail. Hello, I'm Dr. Bob Redfield, and I am the surgical director of the Living Donor Kidney Program here at Penn Medicine. And I am Dr. Kim Oltoff, the surgical director of the Living uh, Liver Donor Program here at Penn. And we the two of us do many of the donor surgeries here, and we'd like to take a few minutes to describe some of the surgical details of the kidney and liver donation process. Dr. Redfield, would you like to start and tell us what's so special about your kidneys? Sure, Dr. Altoff. So the kidney is a remarkable organ. Uh, it's responsible for making urine, which filters toxins and waste out of the body. You have two kidneys, a right and left, and you really only need one to live. So one can be donated to someone with kidney failure and one remains in place. Dr. Altov, how about the liver? Sure, the liver is, real, is, one of, is the largest organ in your body and it's responsible for making important building blocks for the body and removing toxins. It's located in the right upper mid abdomen and it's protected by the rib cage. The really cool thing about the liver is that it's made up of segments and each of the segments has its own blood supply and drainage so it can be split into two functional pieces. 
And which piece is removed depends upon the anatomy and the size of the recipient and the size of the liver they need. Uh, also, what's very remarkable is that the donor and recipient liver segments grow in size uh, over a course of weeks to months to meet the body's needs. So you're probably wondering what the surgery in your hospital stay would be like if you decide to donate. So you'll uh, have preoperative visits with detailed discussions and consents. It'll be the time to ask all of your questions and we'll go all over all of uh, the protocols, including uh, our current pro uh, COVID protocols at Penn Medicine. You'll be admitted to uh, the day of surgery to the preoperative area. Here you'll meet the anesthesia team and some other members of the surgical team that'll be caring for you while you're in the operating room. Specifically for the kidney process, the initial IV will be placed in the pre-op holding area. The rest of the IVs and Foley catheter will be placed in the OR after you're asleep. Surgery typically takes about three hours. Um, you recover initially in the, the recovery area and then in a private room on the transplant floor. Oftentimes patients are walking and drinking the night of surgery and the hospital stay is one to two days. Dr. Altoff, do you wanna talk about the liver process? Sure, uh, you get an initial IV in the pre-op area, and then once you're in the operating room, you will also get an epidural catheter, uh, similar to what women get when they're giving birth, and this is to help with pain control post-operatively. The remainder of the lines and tubes get, pulled af um, get put in after you're asleep. Um, the surgery itself takes about five or six hours, uh, and it's a longer surgery. Um, and you recover in the recovery room, and then you go to the ICU for observation overnight, and then you're transferred to the uh, private room on the transplant floor. We have you up and about uh, in a chair on the first day and walking and eating by post-operative day two. Um, the total hospital stay is about five to six days. It depends upon the patient. The last thing I would add is that, you know, when we do remove the organs, we're able to package them uh, in a cooler like that is shown here. And we take uh, those organs over to the recipient room, which is typically right next door here in the operating room. And both the donor and the recipient end up on the same transplant ward. Um, so you can go and visit each other soon uh, in the days after your transplant. Now, many people want to know what their incision will look like um, uh, when they donate. Uh, on the left here, you'll see what the liver incisions look like. We use an open incision because the liver is a relatively big organ. Uh, the length of the incision depends upon the size of the lobe that's being removed. Um, all the sutures are beneath the skin and no stitches have to be removed or staples have to be removed and healing takes about two to three weeks. Um, for uh, people who donate a small piece of liver, we just use sort of an upper midline incision. And for those who donate a larger piece of liver to an adult, it looks more like a hockey stick. And you can see this photograph here shows an example of one of our donors on the left uh, where her incision is healing nicely. Uh, the recipient uh, is on the right. Thanks, Dr. Altoff. So for the kidney donation, uh, the kidney is smaller than the liver, so we can typically do it laparoscopically. And that requires a few tiny incisions, usually five to 10 millimeters or less than a half an inch. And we use those incisions to insert a camera and surgical instruments to be able to perform the operation. The kidney can't be removed through those small incisions, so it's removed through an incision down by the pant line like a C-section incision. We can use this to either take the left or the right kidney for donation, but usually the left kidney will be removed. Absorbable suture is, uh, are used as well, and healing also takes about two to three weeks. So those are the basic surgical highlights for liver and kidney donation. Of course, if you are interested in donation, our team will spend a lot more time with you to describe all the different details and answer all your questions. Dr. Redfield, any final comments? Thanks, Dr. Altoff, and thank you to all of our um, donors and all those that are interested in becoming uh, a living donor and learning about living donation. It really is the most powerful tool that we have uh, to be able to treat patients with end-stage organ failure.
All right. So um, um, hopefully that was helpful to, to get a high level overview of some of the surgical considerations. Obviously, during the evaluation process, we'll um, uh, go over uh, more detail. If there's additional questions, we can answer them at the Q&A session. Um, so our final donor and recipient story um, is up next, and will give us uh, some more insight into paired kidney donation, uh, what we call the voucher program, and I'll uh, explain that afterwards, uh, and paired kidney exchange. Uh, following this segment, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll have our live Q&A session uh, with myself, um, Dr. Leonberg, and other members of the team. Um, so uh, let's hear from Susan and Alexandria. My name is Alexandria Warner. I received a kidney transplant at Penn and I was lucky enough to receive a kidney from the Pair Donor Exchange Program. My name is Susan Levy Giles and I am a living organ donor. I donated a kidney to an anonymous recipient. I was in a really bad car accident and both of my large renal arteries were severed. So I went from having, you know, normal functioning kidneys to immediately needing a transplant and being on dialysis. I was so weak. I had no energy. I was doing dialysis five days a week for three and a half to four hours. I didn't have any energy to study. I didn't have really the bandwidth to continue pushing myself like I wanted to and continue moving forward with all of my aspirations. The National Kidney Registry has a phenomenal program called the Paired Donor Exchange Program. And it's a program that allows individuals who are in need of an organ donation to sign up with a person that they have identified as a partner who's willing to donate, but who has been deemed not to be a match for the person that they're willing or desire to donate to. And by agreeing to participate in the paired donor exchange, they as a couple are put into a program where others who have agreed to donate, but who are not a match are able to be matched. Alexander and I participated in the pair donor exchange. As much as I personally wanted to be able to donate a kidney to my daughter, I was no longer deemed a match because she had such a high level of sensitivity and had developed antibodies that would reject mine, but I was still willing to donate. And we were put in with a total of 16 people, including ourselves. So there were eight donors and eight recipients. And so I was able to donate a kidney and that went to an individual who I have never met. And in exchange, my daughter was able to receive a kidney from a match that would have been better than mine. As I worked to advocate uh, on my daughter's behalf to help her to get a kidney transplant, I learned about a new program called the Advanced Voucher Program. A friend of mine would always wanted to just donate a kidney gratuitously. And she did not have anyone that she was initially intending to donate for. She offered to donate a kidney to my daughter. However, she wasn't a match. And so what she was able to do was to donate a kidney to someone else, but she was able to do so in my daughter's name. And so my daughter was able to receive a voucher so that in the event that uh, we were to have used the voucher, she was going to be moved up on the list and a match would have potentially have been found for her sooner. There are a number of disparities and barriers for people of color when it comes to organ donation and transplantation. From a patient level, the barriers really focus around a lack of understanding of the organ donation and transplantation process. There's not enough uh, education about the low risk in organ donation. There are challenges in, in, in not only the African-American community, but other communities of color where perhaps it's not talked about as much. 
the benefits that you get uh, emotionally, those benefits far outweigh anything else that anyone can imagine. There are concerns, particularly in the African-American community that we have about having that designated on your license. If something happens, if you're in an accident, then you're not, they're not gonna work to save your life. The paramedics aren't going to try to save your life. The physicians in the ER where you may be taken to are going to just look at you as an organ donor and take your organs. And that in fact is not accurate. That is not true. They don't see your license. They have no idea that you're an organ donor, that you've des been designated as an organ donor. They do what they swear an oath to, and that's to save your life. I think the second category is uh, healthcare providers and the uh, perceptions sometimes and attitudes around the appropriateness of living uh, donors, uh, and particularly living donor for kidney transplants and understanding uh, and having a level of cultural competence in terms of assessing patients and making sure that there is time for patient education and counseling and encouraging the recipients to pursue organ donation and transplantation. And then finally, I think in terms of our healthcare system in the US, um, there is significant mistrust in the medical community uh, by African-Americans and, and other uh, peoples of color. Um, and, and that mistrust is not new and it's not uncommon and it's not unfounded. There's been a history in our country of des desperate treatment. When you think about the Tuskegee syphilis exper experiment um, and you think about the story of Henrietta Lacks, uh, there is some uh, truth and foundation for that, but our healthcare systems come a long way. And there's a lot of education that's been taking place and a lot of protections that have been put in place to help address some of that. There is a tremendous opportunity for individuals like myself who have donated to continue to advocate and share the personal benefits that we receive from donating. When I first discovered that I wasn't a match and that I wasn't going to be able to donate to her, as you can imagine, I was devastated. But when I learned about the Pair Donor Exchange Program, and when I can look in hindsight today in terms of where we are, it couldn't have worked out any better. She got a donor closer to her age. Um, who is healthier than I am even, I'm sure, as a younger person, through that tragedy and through that pain of the accident and having to go through all that she did, I can't begin to tell you how rewarding that is. I would never change that experience and the way that it was able to work out. So for me, having a kidney transplant, it's given me the ability to and this sounds crazy, but from the simplest thing of like being able to like enjoy a shower and just like let the water pour on your head after a really tough day, getting the majority of my week back was just amazing and life-changing. The amount of mental clarity that she had immediately following the surgery was like night and day. I literally saw the difference the very first time I saw her when she came out of surgery and after she was awake. It was just amazing. Since then, I've been able to start like exercising on my own um, and swimming on my own, which has really just brought me so much joy and so much happiness. I am going back to Spelman, so I've started my college career up again. As much as her life changed, mine didn't except emotionally it improved after donating a kidney. I still have the same sense of touch and smell and still mental uh, clarity because I have another kidney and it performs the function of two. And so knowing that I gave someone else a second chance at life is just amazing. 
just having a kidney transplant really started my life back up and has allowed me to achieve so many things that never would have been achievable without it. The only way that you can really describe it is it really is a second chance at life. Thanks, Susan and uh, Alexandria. I mean, it's such a, an amazing story. Um, really to close our, our donor celebration, there was a lot of information that they shared um, and a lot of concepts that they, they presented. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, it's important to understand that if you're, you know, considering donation, um, we at Penn are going to work together as a team to figure out how to support you and what you want uh, and you want, how you want that gift to be um, delivered. So, you know, uh, for uh, kidney transplantation, you can obviously donate directly um, um, if you're a match. Uh, there are some uh, people who choose to still go into paired exchange when they're compatible, meaning that they can directly donate, but they go into paired exchange because they, they may want to help, um, uh, you know, start a chain or help more people. They'll get their recipient transplanted, but just not with their exact kidney. They may, you know, the donor and the recipient may have a big age difference. And um, as uh, Susan had mentioned, you know, um, was able to get um, um, her daughter a, a younger kidney or uh, potentially a better, ki a bigger kidney or uh, a kidney that is uh, a better match. Um, there are some donor and recipient pairs that are compatible, but they're incompatible in time, meaning that they might not want to both be recovering at the same time or maybe it's a friend or a relative who you know the thanksgiving holiday works best for their donation but the christmas holiday or the winter holiday uh, works you know best for um you know the recipient so we're allowed to you know we can facilitate that um but you know when you come in for your evaluation we'll um kind of present all the options and see kind of what resonates with you and and how you'd like, you know, uh, to proceed as well. And, you know, as Dr. Leonberg said, this is really a partnership. And, um, you know, I think, you know, one of the last things is, you know, as Susan and many others have said today, um, while there are really no personal medical benefits to being a living donor, um, and, you know, living donors are, are you know, a real special, um, uh, I hate to say patient population in the, in, in the health system, but it's, you know, um, you are people that are accessing the health system really for no benefit, medical benefit of yourself, um, other than to, to save a life. Um, but uh, organ donation, you know, that life-changing experience, you know, many have said to me has been very life-affirming and the psychological benefits and the emotional benefits um, to being a living donor. Um, to saving someone's life, to being being that person that was able to run into a burning house or um, and and save another human being's life, which is you know really the equivalent to to living donation. Um, I do believe that there are tremendous benefits. Um, so in closing, we're gonna we're gonna jump to the 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 question and answer period. But if you're interested, if there's anyone out there who's interested in learning more about living in living liver or kidney donation, uh, use your phone to, to take a photo of the slide. Um, I believe they're going to be popping up a slide showing the, the QR code um, to um, uh, for the DASH website. Uh, they might have it up now or at the end of the Q&A period. Um, but with that, uh, I do have some questions that people, it uh, looks like Dr. Leonberg has just joined me questions that people have sent in. Hi, Dr. Leonberg. Um, so one of the first questions, I got a number of questions about finding a living donor. Uh, really kind of, uh, I, there are a lot that, you know, from the recipient standpoint, you know, how does one ask? And that's something that, you know, we, we, we hear a lot. And I think I, there is no right answer. I do think it's, it's really hard um, to ask, um, but I do think as 
uh, Mr. Goodwin had said, you know, it's really, you, you have to be able to ask. I think what I'd like to see is, you know, every recipient has an advocate. So whether it's a spouse or a family member um, um, circle of people that can go out into the community and really advocate on your behalf. And I do think, you know, kind of leaving it open-ended um, does make it, I think, less awkward where, you know, saying your doctors, you know, I've really recommended that you need a kidney transplant and really a, li a living donor kidney transplant is, is the best option that they're telling me, you know, do you know anyone um, who would be willing? But I do think getting your story out is really, really important. Um, we've had donors uh, use social media, uh, news outlets, you know, share their story on radio stations, signs, T-shirts, fundraisers, bulletins. I think social media is a really uh, powerful tool that we're probably underutilizing here at Penn. Uh, we're helping our recipients tell their story. We just launched a program um, called Microsites in partnership with the National Kidney Registry where you can um, easily, uh, very quickly upload a photo and a short biography of your story. Uh, it would be on your own kind of personal website. You'd be able to post that website on social media, hand out business cards um, to, to anyone um, uh, that wants to learn more about your story. And then at the end, it will ask, you know, if you want to be, um, say, a living donor for, you know, Alex, uh, and say Alex was the recipient, it will um, funnel you into, you know, our living donor process to learn more about living donations. So that's one of the innovative things that we're trying to do to, to help our recipients. Um, but I think, you know, just in, in summary, the key is, is telling your story and really, um, and asking and, and, and knowing that um, the donation process is safe and it's, it's really not for, the key is just to find a willing person who wants to be evaluated for living donation. Let us decide and do all the testing and decide um, who's healthy um, and who's um, uh, allowable for donation. Um, anything else to add on that, Dr. Liam? Yeah, I'd just like to echo, I think um, we have a lot of um, prior donors on the chat and in the Q&A. And I think that's a really important part of advocacy, just um, sharing your story like we've done today and uh, kind of normalizing the, the living organ donation process, recognizing that it can be safe for um, individuals after a, a medical evaluation by our team. Right. And that, you know, I think that, you know, one of the many questions is, you know, that donors ask us is how can we we advocate? And, you know, uh, Dr. Lienberg really just kind of answered that. and. I think the most powerful thing is to share your story. Uh, like what we're doing today is, because uh, the more that we can normalize um, this extraordinary, you know, gift, um, I think, you know, those ideas are planted in people's minds. Um, you know, uh, primary care physicians get more comfortable with it. Society gets more comfortable with it. And as all the donors know here, um, you know, they successfully donated and, and saved a life. And um, I think the more that we can have our donors um, tell their story, uh, the better. Amanda, I think there's a, a couple of questions on how to best prepare for donation and transplant. Um, one piece of advice for the transplant team. Yeah, we've had a couple questions about this. And so my first recommendation is to see your primary care doctor just to make sure you're up to date on your own healthcare needs. This can include cancer screening, routine healthcare maintenance, and just kind of checking off the box to make sure that from a primary care perspective, you're, health, you're a healthy individual. It is our job to make sure your health status is acceptable and coincides with safely donating either uh, a kidney or a portion of your liver. Um, but I think the first step is engaging with a primary care doctor. We also recommend that you stay fit and active. Um, a healthy lifestyle, both prior to donation and after donation, ensures good, um, a good healthy life following donation. Um, an active lifestyle also helps just with um, maintaining a smoother recovery. You've heard a story of someone who was out of the hospital on hospital day two. This person's a superhero, a very healthy person. Um, 
and is it was able to um, kind of speed up the uh, the recovery period a bit just because of his own baseline level of health. Um, preparation, I think, is um, it's often um, a little bit um, daunting to go through a surgery as a healthy person. Um, and so as much as we can prepare you, we do. By talking through the procedure with you, you'll meet every member of the team prior to surgery. And I think talking with other prior donors, including this session today, we hope that some of the things that were shared with you kind of help um, put some peers at ease, um, just because it is an unknown process for you as a healthy person to come into the hospital and have surgery. Um, I, I think if there were one piece of advice um, to provide to you, either pre-op or post-operatively, I would say follow the directions of your living donor team. Um, we are your advocates in your healthcare, and we want what's best for you. Um, and we understand how to best prepare you for this type of surgery. And post-operatively, take it easy. Rest when you need to. Um, make sure that you give your body some time to heal and recover. Man, I think we have about uh, four or five kind of highlighted yes. questions that I think we could probably, um, you know, address um, in rapid sequence. Um, do you want to kind of take take over the the next couple? Or we're looking at the chat here. Or, um, you know, I think um, just in general, we've gotten a lot of questions, you know, mailed into us. Um, about uh, what is discussed by your team during the meetings and by meet. Um, you kind of touch base with that on, on your, your overview. Yeah, so um, during your evaluation process, you meet with um, many members of the team. Um, and so first and foremost, to prepare for this, um, we ask a lot of questions about any health problems, any prior surgeries, any hospitalizations you've had in the past. Um, we talk about the medications you take now, once to avoid preoperatively and wants to avoid in the future. Uh, we talk about your family health, and so um, it's important to come prepared with your family's medical history. And this is actually really important when we try to understand how hereditary problems or genetic problems can impact your future health. We also talk about your lifestyle. We ask you questions about who you live with, what you do for work, how you help support yourself or your family. And this is to make sure that we're not providing any unnecessary strain or harm either financially or socially. We also talk a lot about motivation for donation. We want to make sure that it's a voluntary process, free of coercion or under, or um, free of any pressure um, in any form. Um, you'll meet with um, nurse coordinators, social workers, pharmacists. You'll meet with the surgeons. You'll meet with either a kidney specialist or a liver specialist. There's a huge team. Um, it truly takes a team effort to proceed with the evaluation as well as to, um, to prepare you for a surgery. And that team doesn't go away post donation either. We're, um, we are your um, healthcare champions after surgery as well, making sure all of your um, immediate post operative questions are answered and ensuring that you have good health long term as well. I think um, we, we've gotten a couple questions about um, timing of evaluation, and I think the timing is a little bit different for every individual. Um, as you can probably tell based on um, the presentations from this, the specialist, the evaluation can be pretty time and labor intensive. And we do do our best to evaluate individuals very efficiently, but it has to be a thorough process. We may ask you to uh, perform some additional tests throughout the way. We, mind, we may find some other um, issues that need to be addressed before we can uh, have you safely move forward in the process. So I think the time frame, it, it's difficult to, um, um, to estimate, um, and it's different uh, for everyone. We also take time as a healthy person with a family and, and work and life responsibilities into play, and we try to help um, um, maintain your schedule and your normalcy throughout the process, too. Um, I think the last question that we've, we've gotten is, how do I know if someone is a match? Um, that's a really good question, and it has a bit of a tricky answer. Um, you know, part of the living donor evaluation is having some compatibility testing, using some blood work. And so the living donor team actually um, understands whether or not you, um, your blood type is compatible or whether there are other types of compatibility um, problems. If you do not have um, complete compatibility with um, the person you're interested in donating to, there are other ways to donate a kidney, and you've heard about many of them today. The Parrot Exchange, the voucher program, um, for example, um, 
these these help um, allow you to um, match with your intended recipient, just not directly. Thanks, Dr. Liam. Uh, yeah, we have a, a specific question about um, some of the differences, the semantic differences, there are technical differences between advanced donation and the voucher program. I will say there's, you know, it can be, you know, somewhat confusing, but I can put some historical context around it um, because there's been a lot of, of um, evolution in, in living donation. The reality now, um, so, you know, about 15 years ago, really the only way to kind of get a living donor uh, transplant would be at a specific um, transplant center. And, um, you know, if you weren't a match, you had to kind of look around in the transplant center to see if you were a match. And, you know, because of the National Kidney Registry, we've been able to kind of link a bunch of transplant centers, almost all of them around around the country, such that we can now exchange uh, kidneys to be able to find matches uh, for recipients um, to be transplanted. Um, what that's allowed us uh, to do is continue to kind of innovate. So um, one of the innovations uh, recently is being able to donate advanced. So typically, you know, a donor and recipient had to kind of go to the operating room the same time. Um, that wasn't the best for a lot of people. Sometimes they wanted to um, uh, donate at different times to be able to care, as I mentioned, for their loved one or, you know, for job responsibilities or whatnot. So advanced donation allows you to uncouple the donor recipient operation. So if you're a donor and you want to donate over Thanksgiving, as I mentioned, or and you can just go donate over Thanksgiving, you won't be able to donate directly to the recipient, but your recipient will get a high quality living donor kidney transplant when they want to get their kidney transplant, which they may maybe six months, you know, could be a year, could be, you know, a three week difference. You know, you both have the power to kind of uh, dictate when that when that happens. As far as the voucher program, um, that's technically for people that don't need a kidney transplant at this moment in time. And, you know, I in theory, voucher donors are really it, advanced donors, and I, that's why I think some people um, kind of get them a little um, confused. But, um, you know, for voucher donors, just, um, you know, imagine a patient who already had a kidney transplant, and, and maybe they're really young, and the concern is that, that kidney transplant's not going to last for the, it may or may not last for their entire life. Um, someone can donate on behalf of them, and we heard a story like that, and give them a voucher. Basically, kind of give them a get out of jail free card. And um, they have a voucher. So, you know, if that first kidney were to fail, um, uh, as it's failing, instead of having to initiate dialysis, they would come to us with that voucher. We would activate them in the National Kidney Registry and find them a kidney that's comparable to the donor that donated. Um, and that that has been a game changer. So, you know, the first voucher holder was um, uh, an older gentleman or voucher donor was an older gentleman. He was a grandfather and his grandson, he knew would need a kidney transplant, did need a kidney transplant at this time. Um, I believe he was around 10 years old, but knew probably in his 20 or 30s was going to need a kidney transplant. It was just a it was a medical certainty. But he was older and he knew if he had to, he had, he was healthy, but he was in his, his, I think, late 60s. And he knew he couldn't wait 30 years because if he waited 30 years or 20 years, too old uh, to donate potentially. And so um, he was able to uh, work with uh, an innovative team at UCLA that um, really kind of uh, was the first um, program to kind of figure this out. Um, and allowed him to donate on behalf of his grandson who would need a kidney transplant. I know it's a little long-winded, but the last thing I will say is the next innovation on that is uh, something that's been live for about a year or so is what we call um, the family voucher program. And that's for, for patients who don't have any evidence of, of kidney failure. Um, and, you know, so if you're a non-directed donor, 
um, you could name uh, a handful of family and friends that if by, you know, and they're perfectly healthy, um, if by chance they did develop renal failure for whatever reason, a traumatic event or an autoimmune disease or, you know, develop diabetes or hypertension, um, one of those, if they were to develop renal failure, could develop, uh, could cash in that voucher and get a living which I think is um, is an important barrier to many for considering altruistic donation. I think, you know, some people, um, I, I think the two main barriers to, to donation right now are the financial barriers. Uh, patients uh, have lost wages and there is some financial sacrifice that we're working really hard to overcome and we have a number of programs to help with that. But also that what if, you know, um, what if, my, you know, four daughters needed a kidney transplant when they grew up. Like, why would I, like, how do I protect against that? I want to help a lot of people, um, but I would, how would I feel if, you know, my daughter when she was 30 would need a kidney transplant? Um, the family voucher solves that problem. You know, you get someone uh, um, in the world transplanted with your kidney and you have a safety net if someone of your family or friends or your your, your social circle needs um, a kidney transplant. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense, but we'll go over a lot of that stuff in our evaluation. Any other questions, Amanda? Yeah, I think we had a couple questions about um, what the Penn Transplant Inst Institute is doing at, with COVID-19. It's a very topical subject right now. Um, we um, remain very committed to uh, maintaining the safety and wellness of all of our patients at Penn. Um, in terms of living kidney donation or living liver donation, we have rapidly shifted to more of an online telemedicine visit for an evaluation, um, just to minimize any, um, any exposure you may have in the clinic. You'll also notice we've shifted to virtual evaluation visits, really truly trying to minimize the in-person visits when, when possible. All of our staff and patients are screened for COVID-19 at the door, so you should feel safe coming into the buildings here. And if the evaluation is approved and you are considered um, appropriate um, to proceed with a donation, um, you will have two screening tests for COVID-19 um, to ensure that this goes, um, goes along smoothly. There does require a period of quarantine prior to and after donation, and that's regardless whether or not you've had the vaccine right now. Um, I think the last point about COVID-19 is things change, things shift, and we, um, and our principle, however, remains the same, which is maintaining your health and safety. Um, I think we've had a couple questions just about how long, a um, couple technical questions. How long is a kidney viable after it's taken out from the donor? Yeah, I can feel that, Dr. Leonberg. Um, so typically, we'd like to get kidneys transplanted within 24 hours. When they're taken out of the body, they are flushed um, with a preservation solution um, called the University of Wisconsin Preservation Solution. Um, and then they are um, held on um, ice. And um, that process allows them to be preserved with good function uh, if transplanted within 24 hours. Um, Typically, you know, if it's a paired exchange uh, and we're doing it in the same hospital, you know, we take it out and um, uh, are able to transplant it right away. Um, if 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 it is an exchange uh, and say we're shipping it, you know, across um, to California or receiving a kidney from California, you know, those are usually um, transplanted within 12 hours, which does not have any deleterious effect uh, to the kidney. It, it functions fine. Um, again, you know, the beauty of living donation is that these kidneys are, are um, donated from healthy individuals as opposed to deceased donors um, that had to go through the dying process and, and most have died because of, of illness. And um, those illnesses have an effect on the kidney. These living donors are really um, the best quality kidney that you could get for, for a transplant. Um, I think there is another technical question on about how long it could be uh, to wait for a paired kidney exchange. It is a great question. It depends on a lot of factors. Uh, depends on blood type. Um, it depends on sensitization status, and that's something that you would learn about. You know whether or not you have any molecules. Uh, it depends on anatomy. 
But, you know, in general, um, and that's why we, we recommend everyone start the process early. So the ideal time is to uh, for recipients to see us, you know, before a dialysis is being initiated, so that we have some runway to be able to kind of optimize um, all the treatment options. Uh, but it can take about three to six months, you know, um, to be able to kind of uh, work through that. Um, and so, you know, there are instances where, you know, you have a ton of antibodies that it can take longer. Um, but yeah, it, it, it usually takes about three months to six months to, to get a match. Just reading through the chat, um, this actually, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Perhaps we can end with um, with a description of the DASH program. Earlier, there was a mention of the DASH program. You're absolutely right, Mark. Um, so, Bob, do you want to explain what the DASH program is and how it streamlined our donor process? Sure. You know, as we are, um, you know, Dr. Leonberg and the rest of the team, the leadership team, are really uh, focused on trying to um, deliver enhanced donor care and kind of streamline our processes. And one of those is our initial process was, you know, pen and pencil and um, filling out, you know, paper forms. Uh, we again have partnered with the National Kidney Registry to, to utilize um, one of their online donor. Um, that obviously has kind of streamlined our process such that and made it easier for for most people that have access to uh, computer systems uh, where you can enter in all your medical and social history at your convenience um, submit the form there are some some automatic rule outs you know if you've had a heart attack um, those are instances where really donation is not the safe thing for you um, and um, if you pass through that, that initial screening process, um, the system will uh, have you go for some screening labs, just some basic laboratory assessments, which we can then you know, make a, an assessment. Is this, is this something that looks like from a medical standpoint is in your best interest? And then from there, um, um, you know, we're able to connect you with our coordinators and start, um, if you kind of pass those two stages, um, move to the next stage in the evaluation. And, and our hope is that, you know, the more kind of streamlined things are, you know, the, our hope is to make, we realize that most of our living donors are, are busy and obviously healthy and, and working and have a lot of time commitments and our commitment to you is to try to make this um, as easy of a process as possible. And, you know, we really want to do away with the waiting time and the inefficiencies that all too often plague our healthcare system. And with that, we, we will be showing our, our QR code for being able to, um, to register through the DASH program. Again, this is an online. Um, essentially healthcare screening form that gets submitted to Penn Transplant Institute. It's reviewed by our donor coordinators. Um, you'll receive some automated replies that will ask you to get your blood work done um, and will provide some additional instruction um, based on any, um, any criteria that may have been flagged on that screening form. So you can see it right here. Feel free to scan the QR code or visit our website um, just to, um, um, to um, to learn more about that dash um, online portal. Well, I think that um, that does it. And um, I really want to thank everybody for attending. This was our, our inaugural uh, first virtual living donor symposium. Donate Life Month for the month of April. I, I really want to applaud all the donors. Um, just amazing stories. Um, thankfully, my 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 camera was off because there was definitely many moments where I was getting choked up because it's just so um, touching. And um, I really want to thank the incredible team that we have here at Penn Medicine. Um, everyone uh, from the surgeons and the administrative leadership to um, our nurse coordinators and uh, mid-level providers and 
our MAs and our PSRs and the recipient coordinators. It's it's a team sport. We can't just do this um, uh, individually. And um, we are deeply committed to to the care of the of the donors. And I'm just so proud of the entire team for putting this all together. Um, and uh, hopefully everyone found this informative. And um, thank you again to our donors who have done this. You truly are uh, our heroes. Um, so with that, I think we're going to close the session. Uh, if there's any additional questions, please feel free to uh, email us um, at uh, pentransplantevents at penmedicine.upenn.edu. I don't know, Mark, if you can pop that up. Um, that's pentransplantevents at penmedicine.upenn.edu. Thanks, everyone, for your attention.